Okay, Katina, thank you for joining us uh, from Arizona. And I will now uh, hand over to you for, for your presentation. Thank you so much, Moira, for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon as it is in Vienna. Today I'm presenting to you a, a package on caring for children online, co-designing in the public interest. And this presentation uh, has been worked on uh, with Dr. Robert Abbas uh, from the University of Wollongong in the Faculty of Business and by myself, Katina Michael from Arizona State University. So I wanna frame the context of this presentation. What are we really talking about? Who is responsible for children's care online? And there are three key words in this framing. It's children, that is people under the age of 13, responsibility and care. According to COPPA, children online are those that are under the age of 13. We are not just generally talking about minors, but in particular, children. And care online involves meeting the needs of ourself and others who are dependent and vulnerable. And we often refer to vulnerable populations or minority groups or dependents. And these are people that require support uh, for decision making, perhaps, uh, in the case of children, because they are under the age of 13. And if I have been cared for, I have a responsibility to care for others in the context of the digital services usage. So whose responsibility is it to care for children online is a recurring theme throughout this presentation. If we look at, for example, an ABC television series called In the Night Garden, we have terminology here on this screenshot which indicates that a child has the capacity to make a decision on whether or not to switch on or off the webcam. In this case, we have a Facebook help page, which requires everyone to be at least 13 years old before they create an account, depending on the jurisdiction. And so Facebook is telling us, if you're under the age of 13, you really shouldn't have a Facebook page or a Facebook uh, social media <coughs> account. But how can this really be policed by the provider? How can this be enforced? Here we have an example of a toy that was created by Mattel for six year olds and above, which has an inbuilt camera and can record at the child level right down to the ground as children are at play. The child is then enticed to go online and share their videos with Mattel's website using the Toy Talk facility. And then we are told that they can edit online, but who has access to those recordings and that information? And you can see here from some of the screenshots how provocative some of these images are, in particular this one. So the real working video camera in the video camera girl. We've seen a lot of articles come out in the last 12 months about toys that are listening, the IoT enabled internet connected toys. They listen, they can see, and they have increasingly different tactile sensors that can elicit responses in children. How are parents to keep up with these innovations? How are they to absorb the recommendations and precautions on the back of these toys? More recently, we've had a hashtag wake up Instagram uh, campaign launched by a group called Collective Shout, which is talking about how predators uh, are abusing children online or taking the images, again, Instagram requiring you to be 13 years and above. So they're accessing these comments and these pictures that kids are innocently putting up online and uh, harvesting them on the dark web. We then have uh, companies, unfortunately, like Google, violating the privacy rights of children. Most recently, the FTC fined them $170 million. And on their, in their defense, they've come back with some commensurate response. We're sorry, we're going to rectify the situation and we're going to take account of who's loading what. And so now in the beta version of the YouTube, what you find is yes, this video was made for kids or no, it was not. This video is for uh, viewers over the age of 18 or it is not. So we are seeing some response from the companies working in the digital service space. We've also got TikTok that was fined for collecting data of minors. And this is an unbelievable thing that we are seeing the, the privacy invasion of children online. So their name and their personal information, their emails, 
and their location was being harvested by Chinese company TikTok. We've seen schools uh, you know, initially show outrage towards such location-based social networking apps as Snapchat Map, which without warning introduced this new feature to Snapchat back in July of 2017, and by default actually had the children who were using Snapchat sharing their real-time location. On the right-hand side, you can see an example of a middle-aged person who abused the access to this Snap Map and befriended girls using a fake account called Ashley Cheer 6 and then began to become a peeping Tom watching the girls undress as they gathered because he had this information. And he was caught by law enforcement officers who tracked him uh, actually jumping fences. So once the outrage came from the schools, from the parents, Snapchat actually responded and made this feature, uh, not an, made this feature an opt-in feature. So we revisit the question, who is responsible for children's care online? Is it the child, the end-end -end user? I mean, the child cannot afford to buy these services or to gain access to a computer without parental supervision or at a friend's house or at a library or school. But in terms of self-regulation, a child is really exempt from self-regulation. That's why many children who are engaged in the act of sexting actually are not put in juvenile courts because they are under the age. The parent, is the parent responsible? The school, does the school self-regulate? The company offering the product or the app or the content, are they co-regulators, for example, through a communications alliance, which is an industry-driven alliance? Is it the regulator, for example, the Australian Communications Media Authority? Is it the government, like the e-safety commissioner in Australia? Or is it law enforcement then, that then enforces legislation for example, the Think You Know program launched by the Australian Federal Police. And so we have this jostling. You know, schools go out there and say, here's your user agreement. Child, sign this. Parent, sign this. And then put it to the school and we'll store it in a safe place. Is the school then passing the buck to the parents or the end end user, the child? Or is the school also taking some responsibility for how they will uh, enable digital services online. I know of one particular school that says, look, we don't want your children using services that are not for 17 years and under. And what we do hope, however, is that they have access to YouTube. And so all of a sudden, it's almost like they nullified their user agreement because what they're saying is that they can use whatever service they want, except for Google. And then Google introduces all these other potential harms, depending on what the child is watching. And suggestions for addressing this age-appropriate digital service. What is it? Well, we've seen Korea, for example, move to a real ID. It's a user ID, government-instituted identity pass onto the access to the internet. And they secure that allegedly with a password. So it contains the South Korean's real name and also the national security number. And that's called an IPIN, an internet personal identification number. We've got other suggestions uh, coming from sort of non-government non instituted uh, services. For example, app providers have said it's easy. Why don't we get uh, young people or minors to actually store their fingerprint on their secure device like an iPhone, which places the fingerprint in an area that can't be touched by external entities. It's a secure enclave. So then we have a unique fingerprint. The child can actually log on but that assumes that every child has an iPhone, that every ch child has fingers, and that there's a whole bunch of inclusivity issues there. But does it also denote that we are moving to an era that if you don't have a smartphone, even as a toddler, you're a non-toddler or a non-child or a non-person. So what we've seen over time is tech that's built for kids. Actually, not really. Internet. Was that built for kids? No, it was built for defence. The GPS was also built for defence. CCTV for law enforcement. And border control, mobile technology, smartphones, social media, inbuilt laptop cameras, biometrics. None of these were actually built for kids. And on this screen, the only thing that may have been built for kids was the swing. And you can see the parent jostling with control to the phone uh, with the child. Uh, providing guidelines for the child. So the real question is here, theoretically, and in practice, how do we design for kids? 
And a lot of people are looking at the co-design literature. Uh, Dr. Roba Abbas is a specialist in this approach. She looks at participatory design and increasingly moving to cooperation, cooperative design and consultation. How do we design for kids? We can do this in a number of ways. We can observe them. We can bring them on as users. We can ask them to become testers of our digital services or informants or design partners on an equal footing with developers. And depending on the degree of input, as you can see here from top to bottom, you might get a better result coming out. But it's a continual iterative process. And the real question here is, how do we design with kids for kids? It's not how do we design for kids without including them in this development process. It's how do we design with kids for kids? And if we revisit this paradigm here for a moment, who is responsible for children's care online? It's all of these stakeholders. It's not just the parent. It's not just the child that's entering an age of awareness. It's not the school alone that's looking at cyber safety and other questions. It's not just the company provider of the apps and the content and the smartphones and the services. It's not just the regulator. It's a whole of stakeholder effort. And we bring along all of these stakeholders into the co-design process in a complex design endeavor to basically become observers, but mostly design partners, if we can muster that kind of support. And what is special about designing with kids, as Dr. Abbas has realized through her many engagements with children in childcare centers, is the way we communicate and articulate concepts to children. They're not gonna understand what a systems development process is, but we can use a degree of formality in our language uh, we can break down our language to the level understood by a four-year-old or a six-year-old. We could talk about stories and narratives. We can be flexible. We can validate and elaborate, understand the inconsistencies and increasingly collaborate alongside with them. And this is really about the public interest technology in the context of kids. It's about emerging technology for good, using our internet for the hopes of what we created it for, not just military use or, or a garbage dump. The social implications and risk impact assessments are notified and realized. We have collaboration and participation in the public interest, particularly in the child's interest. When we look at child impact assessments and suitable regulatory provisions which engage anticipatory governance. And this is where I'd like to introduce a new initiative by the IEEE, sponsored by the IEEE Consumer uh, Electronics Society. It's the IEEE standard P2089, which I have the good fortune of being the working group chair. We just had our first meeting about two weeks ago. And this standard is looking at how we set benchmarks for age appropriate digital services based on the five rights approach, the right to remove, the right to know, the right to safety, the right to informed and conscious use and the right to digital literacy. So these are the underlying things in recognition that the user is a child. And that child is not the same as somebody who's not a minor, who is an adult. We're looking at their capacity and how we can uphold the rights of children, terms that are appropriate to children, not just these legalese languages that say to the company, well, once they've consented and not read the policy and the terms and conditions we put up our hands, it's no longer our problem. We just built an app like a location-based social networking tool. And we present information in an age-appropriate manner offering validation for service design decisions. So the future now, what is happening at the moment? Well, we have conversational bots that are not toys, but that, and they're not embodied in a traditional toy. They don't have a frame like a Barbie doll. They don't have a frame like my friend Kayla, but now we have children befriending IoT devices. And there's a lot of research that has to go into that. What happens when parents have given up the cause to care? Well. They're quiet, they're sitting in the corner, that's okay, I'll just go on with my work uh, in our 24 times seven environment. So what happens when families say, well, everyone's doing it, it looks normalized and it's just the mass market, that's just the way this generation is. Is it a cop out? And what happens when organizations are making more money from exploiting our children than the penalties handed down by government agencies for breaches? What happens when they can wear the fine, the privacy intrusion into the children's life, whether they're playing a game or they're, they're interacting on some other digital app? 
what happens when they're making more money from the datification of the child than actually the breaches and penalties that are handed down? And what happens when government try to respond to this by offering digital identities that nullify anonymity and autonomy of the child? So in future research and in closing, we'd like to look at the role of media literacy in the offering of digital products and services. What happens when we have a load of disinformation as we have today? And furthermore, deep fakes. The need for parents to be parents, for example, following the 36912 guideline created by the late Kimberly Young. The need for private companies to act responsibly in offering services to children online. The need for government and law enforcement to consider novel ways of maintaining the anonymity of their users while encouraging secure online services that do not impinge human rights. As Anne Kavukian says, privacy and security by design. And finally, regulatory penalties when principles are breached that are commensurate to that breach. I'd now like to um, offer a, a time for questions uh, if any time is left over. Thank you. Thank you, Katina. And yes, uh, I would like to invite uh, the room if there's one or two questions for Katina. Um, please raise your hands. So, oh, Perry. Hi, Katina. I'm not sure what country you're in right now. It's Perry. Um, okay. So, if you are going to give your forecast of hopeful or despondent, over our ability to get to where we need to on keeping our children safe, private, and secure online, where would you be on that scale? Somewhere in the middle, Perry, not to cop out myself. Um, I'm neither <laughs> pessimistic or optimistic. I mean, there have been so many dark scenarios of our futures, and I often think of Professor Ramona Pringle, a transmedia specialist in Canada, it talks about the cautious optimism. How do we actually get to the positive side? What has to happen? What kind of change in society where we start to take responsibility at multiple levels? You know, most of us are parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles, friends of people who have children and so forth. When we start to look at our personal responsibility, and I know that might seem like a, a, a high you know, impossible task. But I think we can move that forward with a repositioning. It's really only a repositioning. Yes, we all want these digital services. We want access to them at the right stage. So how, how do we change the mindset, Perry, um, to actually engage the general community towards the public interest to take responsibility for themselves, caring for oneself first, and then having respect and care for the other who might be a minor, for example. I really enjoy the work that you're doing online. I, I can see like a, a twofold commensurate impact. You know, the AAA are going towards a standard of benchmarks. And then we have organizations like yours that are raising instantly the awareness of the general public and of the community online, for example, in LinkedIn. So by working together, there are so many non-government organizations advocating in this space for children. I think one of the things that NGOs have suffered long in the past as I've been involved in privacy organizations is that they haven't worked very well together because of their being understaffed, not utilizing expert tools, but I kind of like what's, what's happening at the moment. There has been a commensurate response. There has been an outcry from parental groups. There have been non-government organizations sprouting up in this space. So while I won't be able to hear your talk immediately, I will live stream in, Perry, but I encourage you to continue on this path because I think it's raising instant awareness. So these kinds of constant campaigns are necessary. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And um, not seeing any other questions. So Katina, thank you very much for joining us online and uh, for this uh, great presentation. And um, thank you also to Dr. Abbas, who unfortunately couldn't join us, but we thank both of you for putting this together and joining us. Thank you so much, Mara. Have a great right, day. So we'll close the Zoom. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you.